Well, we're back. We are back. Season, Season two. two. Mm. Nice, nice. Um, well, guys, good to have you back. Uh, Anthony and I have been uh, contemplating, you know, how we're going to come back on which topic, on which what, and there was all this uh, planning and structuring. And then, of course, an event happens. Mm. Was it two days ago now? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, over the weekend, three days ago, whatever it was. Um, and it's just like the pressure's like, yeah, you guys need to talk about this. Mm. Um, mm. And considering what you're actually talking about, um, the stabbing, multiple stabbings at mm. Bondi mm. Um, in Sydney uh, from this crazed individual. And uh, even then overnight, we have another crazed individual that decides to stab a Catholic priest live on Facebook mm-hmm. while he's broadcasting at one of his sermons, 15-year-old kid. Unbelievable. It's just uh, the world's gone mad. It has. And look for, if you haven't worked out already, uh, just a warning that obviously we will be speaking about these tragic events. Um, if it causes you concerns, there is a, a plethora of organisations you can contact in your local area. Um, but if this is the type of content that might worry you, we recommend that you don't listen to this episode. It's good when you tell people not to listen to yourself. But <laughs> Fuck me at home. It's like, yeah, I was going to say, like, when you've got kids. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Well, Anthony, um, I think what's fitting, I mean, you were you, you exited the police force as, as the rank of inspector. Um, and obviously the heroic acts of the inspector mm. Um, mm. saved the day. Yep. Um, like, what was your take on it, considering that, you know, would have been something you would have had to do as a single unit? Uh, maybe we can explain um, the unlikelihood... Of, of an inspector usually coming into these <laughs> into these proceedings, um, just so that people understand. Yep. A lot of people were saying, "Why was she alone? Yep. Where was her backup?" Maybe if you could explain that to the people on how that actually works out. Yeah, look, I think you've got to understand these uh, really at the rank of both sergeant, like you, uh, you and I were, and then uh, at inspector, you're on the road, but you're there's not an expectation that you're attending to and managing jobs by yourself. Your job is supervision and Um, overseeing, making decisions, uh, applying resourcing and ensuring that strategy and tactics are employed appropriately with the proper resources. Now, that's all well and good, but um, I know I've had it as a sergeant and as an inspector, I know you've had it multiple times, Um, something happens in front of you, You, you're not waiting for backup, there's no, there's often no time. So, um, the single unit policing model suggests that if something happens, you wait for backup or you try to do something like a, you know, contain, negotiate on the weekend, that that was never going to happen. And that is what we call um, an active armed defender scenario taking place. And the principle is virtually step over everybody that is wounded as a police officer. Don't, Don't go managing any of the situation first people on arrival get in there and remove the threat. So paint the scene, what would have been broadcast over the radio that, mm. you know, that this inspector has responded to? Uh, I, I heard from the news reports the, some of the live broadcast information and uh, it was, as we've become used to, um, multiple reports coming in, you know, person armed with a knife and then gradually it increases, person in the shopping centre armed with a knife, person in the shopping centre has stabbed someone, someone seen on the floor with um, blood on them, you know, possibly not breathing. Um, and then I believe it was Eastern Suburbs 35 called off first. Um, and 35 means they're in a, in a, they would have been a pair of police officers, but they're in a sedan. Uh, but at, immediately after that, um, Eastern Suburbs 10 uh, was broadcasting inside. This is He's going here in full pursuit. And 10 would be what? 10, would, 10 means you're the inspector. That's the call sign for an inspector, 14s. Yeah, which would be by, And they'd be by themselves. They're by themselves, yeah. yeah. Um, now, one of the interesting things is um, having worked over in Eastern, Eastern Suburbs, Eastern Beaches, the... Command office used to actually be across the road in a um, office building, across the road from um, the Westfield. The Westfield. So, yeah. Oh, so I don't know if it still is, but that would account for potentially why the officer was so close and so um, re- able to respond so quickly. Um, 
And also, look, Waverley Police Station is really not that far yeah. down the road. Yeah. But, um, you know, if anybody's been to Bondi Junction on a Saturday afternoon, it's terrible when it comes to traffic. So yeah. um, that always plays into it. And you've got a, the situation with Westfield is multiple entry <coughs> exit, exit points. And it's so hard to navigate where the person is, if that makes sense, because yes. it's, you're probably getting it from multiple people saying, oh, they're here, they're there. And by the time it's been broadcast, that person's gone. That's right. And it's yeah. really hard to map out. In a shopping centre, following that person is not easy. Getting relayed over radio, no. you know, where to find them. And you... Look, you have these issues where you've got to consider, all right, what resources do you deploy to a central point, for example, uh, to manage that? Can you send someone to the security office to watch the CCTV to give you direct information as to where they are? Yeah. Um, in this instance, though, you've also got, you're fighting against the flood of people coming out, right? Um, and people... In these situations, I'm not saying I've been in that exact situation, but you and I have definitely been in situations where there's a rush of people coming out and people start shouting at you. They see a uniform. And, and so then you've got like multiple people shouting information at you and you're trying to like discern it and get asked questions yep. because people like there's a guy with a knife, but what you really want to know is, okay, I know there's a knife, but what's he wearing? Yeah. Where's he at? Yep. Where was, what direction was he traveling? Um, was he on this floor or the next? You know, there's, there's a cacophony of sound but you're trying to generate some kind of you know meaningful useful information that you can broadcast to the other cars as well yeah i mean it, it triggered something in me straight away because i did have something really similar um years back and i was single unit because i was the crime prevention officer in those mm. days so i was already at um in those days banks down central um and it was frequent for me to go to the centre and, and liaise with security for CCTV. We were doing crime prevention um, mm -hmm. sort of seminars with mm -hmm. all the shopkeepers, um, like a like a business watch, be safe um, sort of thing, neighbourhood watch of business sort of thing. And one day I was there, and they called the job for someone who's uh, brandishing a knife in the um, one of the women's clothing sort of stores. And then that quickly escalated to. He's holding the, the workers hostage in there. And all of a sudden, I'm like, well, this is... I was probably... I was underneath. I was on the, on the mm. gallery level, sort of just underneath where it was happening. Um, and so, you know, you're not going to sit there and... You, you know, you broadcast that you're on there. I remember running upstairs to get to there. And there was one security guard um, that had turned up. And obviously, the security knew me really well. I've been there for years. And he's given me the info. So then I'm correcting it because then it gets read on radio with all different people. To start, yes. Yeah. And the descriptions, like they go from a guy that's six foot to a guy that's five foot three, from large to small. Like, you know how people are. They just, under stress, they, mm -hmm. they think they saw something, but they didn't. That's right. And this guy had holed himself up in a change room. So the, the, the two girls that were working in this um, uh, sort of fashion uh, store had locked themselves into the staff room. And so he was... In, on his own in the change room um, with a knife and he'd locked the door uh, for the change room door itself. So we'd evacuated everyone from the store. It was just mm. him. And now you've got a bit of an interesting situation because you've got a guy with a decent sized knife. Um, he was probably, I remember he was like in his mid twenties. Um, and he'd bought the knife from the, from a store yep. downstairs, right? Um, threatened the staff, but then they locked themselves in, which was smart. They did really well. Uh, so he couldn't get, get to them. And I don't even know what the purpose of him doing this was. Um, and so I remember asking the security guard to get me a little stool because, you know, those mirrors, yeah, right? So they have mirrors in certain areas of the change room so in case you're stealing stuff. But it doesn't see in, mm, right, for mm. obvious reasons. But if you can get high enough, you can see what's happening. Uh, and at this stage, uh, who rocks up to support me? An inspector. So there's yeah. an inspector. He ends up coming in by himself. Um, and he, this guy was a really good operator. I had a lot of time for him. Um, he turns up, so it's just me and him. And he was, he was the only person carrying a taser in the police yes. station at the time because they started to give it to single unit officers first, right? Mm. So only one sergeant, one inspector. And I think from memory, Bankstown was the trial yeah, police station yeah, for tasers. So we've never used it before, right? So it was maybe the second week of tasers, something like that. And so he, he had one on him. And I'm like, well, this is the test, right? Mm. Um, so looking over the, 
um, on, when they got a little, a little stool, I could see him and he was holding sort of the knife close to himself. And those doors, a change room door, it's not the greatest lock in the world. And I'm thinking, if we kick this in, he's going to be trapped. If we do it right, we might be able to actually... Yeah, yeah hold him behind the door. Hold it exactly right. Um, but the inspector's like, we'll give, we'll give the taser a, a taser run. Taser a bill, yeah. Yep. <clears throat> so we're like, okay. Um, so the, the, the plan we made, you know, we're whispering to each other, like, how are we going to do this? I'm like, you taser it. If it doesn't work, I'm just going to kick the door in. Right? We'll, we'll just yep. do everything at once and see how we go. Um, and not the whole time, another security guard comes and we're holding up a mirror, so now we can see the other side. So we've made like a little sort of you know, um, makeshift strategy there. And lo and behold, bang, he fires the taser. And you know when you hear that really loud sound? Yeah. So you know it's not working. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Miss. So, yeah, so the taser, if it hits, the probes hit right, it's a distinct sort of controlled mm, hum mm, as opposed mm. to a really loud zapping. Yeah, like a of, crackling yeah, sound. When he, yeah, then you're like, ah, oh, crap, one of them's out. And so I think... One of the probes is yeah, out. Yeah, I think what's happened is he got scared from that sound. So he's thinking he's probably going to be fried. And that this disoriented him, so then I kicked the door yeah. and we were on top of him and we, we disarm him. But again, it was like single unit, you're just thinking to yourself, you have to stop the threat. Mm. There's a reason why you carry the stuff you carry on you. Yeah. And it's not always a matter of, oh, I'm just going to wait for, for backup, especially when someone's going to be, because he might have tried to cut himself. You well, don't know what he's yeah. trying to do. And, and this is the thing. Look, I think when I look at that, as, as more information comes to light, there's a, there's a lot of takeaways and a lot of points to draw from it. I mean, um, obviously he was suffering by the sound of it a mental health episode um, and it seems as though he was targeting women. Um, there's an, it's kind of ironic that a woman was the person that stopped him as well. Yeah. Um, there's a point in the fact for me that the benefit is you have someone there like Inspector Scott who's obviously like to get to get to inspector it's not like you just join the police force and apply for that rank you've you've at least done years to yeah. get to there yeah. um, and that means by that time you should have very clear tactical thinking you should understand that the models in place and the policies and procedures your decision making for something like that you shouldn't be second guessing yourself because you will have had that experience before um, and so a sergeant or an inspector there should be able to, you know, as big a decision as that is, the potential knowing that you're not trying to take a life, she's trying to stop the threat, but you know there's a potential outcome that the life will be ended there, um, but is able to discern all the relevant information available to him at the time and make the decision and clearly did that. Um, so I think that was a fabulous in that regards, I feel for her because I'm sure no one goes to work thinking, yeah. even though we all know, we all, everybody carries, you become quite complacent with firearms as a police officer. Yeah. I'm not saying unsafe, I'm saying it's just, you strap on a bunch of tools when you yeah. go on shift. It's just added weight inconvenience. Yeah, and you know what, you yeah. don't think about it, um, and some people get additional training, but honestly, the training you get as a cop is pretty... Outside of the first uh, academy sessions you yeah. go through and do with your firearm, you're really doing a requalification shoot once a year. Yeah. Um, no one encourages, you can do it, I have done it, I did do it, um, and I recommend anybody else to do it if you can get access to it, but additional training outside of the cops on pistol shooting yeah. um, because there have been cases where police have shot at an offender um, and I think here one in particular in a very, and I'll, I'll bring this up later, please remind me because I'll probably forget, uh, but go back to other similar incidents like the Hornsby shopping mall incident where a man with, suffering a mental health episode with a large knife um, confronted police and he was shot by police as well as a number of bystanders. Now, there's, there's a whole bunch of issues there. The benefit in this particular instance is, there's benefit if I can say that, is the shopping centre was in the process of, you know, they've done everything right. You know, they've pulled people back into the shops, they've locked down as best they could, they've tried to evacuate people. So the possibility for, you know, damage to other people, like collateral damage, um, ricochets and 
um, just inadvertent missing um, yeah. or look sometimes at close range even though they're hollow point bullets they can potentially move through um, someone depending on where you get them so you know I remember in the um, academy they used to call them and and please take it for what it's worth they used to call it granny killers yeah, yeah. when you'd miss the target like yeah. that's a granny killer you suck yeah. um, but it's reiterating to the students that when you when you have a point that you draw your firearm you pull that trigger you have the potential to not just take a life in front of you, but that of someone else behind But you. that's the thing. The lockdown's so important. Because, mm-hmm. again, imagine he just... He runs into one of the stores, yeah. holds himself up, and then it's, you've got a siege. Like, it's not easy. Exactly right. It's not easy at all to, to take someone out once you're in that situation. No. So it no. really is a whole process that has to... You want a lot of moving parts, and they need to work. Mm-hmm. And the, the other thing is, like, the inspector is usually the one coordinating. Yeah. Right? So to come in and, like, okay... I'm I'm paying attention to where all the all the crews are because she's got a duty to her, yeah. her team, right, to look after the the crews as well. Um, it's it's a lot. It's a lot a lot on her plate. She's done extremely well. And let, let's remember too, um, in all of these instances, again, we speak about that cacophony of information, the rapid moving part of a frenetic environment where. She didn't know if there was other offenders yep. moving around. Yep. She didn't know if he was armed with a knife and there was someone else with a gun somewhere. Um, you know, she didn't know what else was going on anywhere else in the city. You know, when you go back to the Lynch siege where there yep. was a belief that there was multiple, multiple. Um, locations that mm-hmm. had bombs and IEDs placed in them. Yep. So you're trying to manage all of that but then immediately after she deals with that situation, she applies first aid um, and starts trying to coordinate things by the sounds of it. And I think that, you know, there's... No one wants to be in that situation, but I'm very glad that someone as capable as her was there. And I'm glad... I, I'm hopeful that um, all officers at that standard are at that standard. One of my other takeaways, and this is for anyone that's looking to join the police, anybody that's in the police force or law enforcement in general. And honestly, just for the community at large, fitness Mm. and the ability to function under stress is extremely important. Now, without bragging too much, humble brag, uh, Danny and I are both into martial arts. Um, Danny's more highly ranked than I am. Um, But I trained constantly when I was in the cops. Um, And outside of it being good stress relief, it's just... When you look at the vision of Inspector Scott, she's running, trying to catch up with this guy, right? Now, we don't know if she had to run from one side of the shopping centre to the other, and she's trying to communicate. So you can't... It's very difficult. If you ever tried to talk and do so in a cohesive manner so that someone can hear you over the radio, and radios aren't always the best um, way to pick things up, and hear on the other side... And then when you after you try holding a glass of water still after you've done like a one kilo, like a yeah. five hundred meter sprint, say yeah. plus the adrenaline and everything else, and yeah. so that is the same for shooting, right? Um, they do an exercise in the in the academy going back to that point where you run, yeah. and then you come back and you do. I've seen I've done other simulations where you run, you do push ups, you do whatever else, you get breathless, and then you've got to get off certain, so many rounds in a short period of time. Because your fine motor skills just yep. start disappearing. Your yep. ability to be able to aim and do that. Um, and that, like, obviously she wasn't the type of... One of my big bugbears, no disrespect to people, I understand how it happens, is fat cops. If you are charged, you know, like, if you're in charge of someone's safety at any point in time, be that your own, yeah. your partner, yeah. or the communities, yeah. keep a standard. If you're going to have to run... Yeah. Right. And that's the thing. Like, th- there's a difference. Like, if you're f- number one, if you're in uniform. Mm-hmm. Number two, if you're you know you're front line, and then especially if you're in certain commands where it's like it's you know it's you quite know likely always, yeah. it's quite likely something's happening. There's a level of responsibility as well to yeah. your colleagues and to yourself, and you know you want to be in a certain level of shape, you know, to to sort of do that. And it's more about yeah, exactly fitness. This needs to come into it um, because your situational awareness mm-hmm. um, can be let down if your body can't respond. Now, don't, don't even get me started on the organisational responsibilities and what they're not doing to help cops with fitness. Yeah. And I understand shift work is one of those, it's a fitness killer. Yeah. You know, you, your body clock's all over the place. There's no, nothing open. You're always busy. Yeah. Maccas is the easy go-to. Um, and 
you know, when you when it's three or four o'clock in the morning, you're just looking for a feed. Like I remember, the only thing open is terrible. You'd always get those questions. Oh, is it true you guys have like um, like gyms in the in the yeah, stations no. and you're training and you know there's like a, a shooting range and like yeah no nah. no nah, <laughs> <no. laughs> none of that good stuff nah. that you think exists. No, nah. that's like the ones where they think that there's a psychologist on premises always there to talk yeah. to you things and you know all this kind of stuff and yeah. you know your your inspector comes and gives you a coffee that's near. Yeah. No. Yeah, the no. movies just it doesn't it doesn't happen. It doesn't no. happen. But I think what was also like t- stepping back from it. Now that information is, you know, and it's always like that. Information trickles in the beginning about who this person is and what their motivations are, right? And it was interesting to see all the um, the assumptions that were made mm. and straight away on, on on who this person is and, and and why they did it, right? And it dovetails into what happened overnight, but. Basically, straight away it comes out because it's in Bondi, so it's in. Oh, this is um, is this something to, going back to the conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians? And, and just to highlight for people, uh, if you don't know Sydney well or you don't know the culture cultural enclaves in Sydney, yeah. Bondi is an area synonymous with the Jewish community. There's a high proportion of members of the Jewish yeah. faith yeah. Uh, that reside and in that area. Synagogues and yeah, 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 yeah. So. You know, straight away that comes out. So it must have been a terrorism attack, and you know, mm-hmm. and by terrorism would have been Islamic terrorism. You know, anti-Jewish, anti-Israeli, anti-Semitic, whatever you mm-hmm. want to call it, whatever. Um, and then what's funny is looking at if we talk legal definitions, right? So for it to be considered a terrorism event, there needs to be an ideation. So there needs yes. to be some kind of political, religious, some kind of cause that the person is trying to. Um, you know, that's part of the achievement of what of what the goal is. As, as the information comes to light, the commissioner comes out herself and says there's no audiation. Yes. Right? In the next 24 hours, there's strong sentiments of misogyny. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, so did the audiation now come into play? Yeah. Would we consider someone who has a bias against women? But that falls into the hate crime version, yes. doesn't it? Is, there, yeah. you know, that, is that their motivation? Does it go back into, are we now looking at terrorism again? Right. And there, there is... You probably have a good understanding of this too. Sorry to interrupt. You remember in the States that there was a particular um, movement of these dysfunctional men that were against women because they couldn't get dates and they couldn't yep. do this. Yep. And I'm trying, they had a particular yeah, name, yeah, but I there was a that. number of murders yes. and attempted murders carried out by this same type of yeah. individual and, and profile of individual. Yes, like. and look how dangerous that was. Ah, yeah. So, I mean, like... This is like a, you know, you've got a mass casualty event. It's public. It's, uh, mm. it's where children and, and look, I mean, we had a very young child also injured in the, in oh, the process. Oh. And the mother, unfortunately, gets killed, right? No. There's a, a, lot, of, a lot of horrificness around, around, around this sort of sentiment. Um, and it's like, okay, I mean, are we, are we getting these legal definitions right? Yeah. Are, are we going to be punishing people and, and you know, uh, across the board uh, along the same, same lines? And, you know, unfortunately then overnight what happens, a 15-year-old decides to um, sit into a mm-hmm. sermon mm-hmm. and then go and attack the priest, yeah. you know, um, obviously trying to stab him and kill him. You know, he's, for, he's lucky that his knife doesn't work. Um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't outright and it, the, the blade goes back in and so then he doesn't, he's not able to achieve his purpose before he gets accosted by everybody else. Um, and they proceed to do some interesting, horrific things to this fifteen-year-old as well, um, you know, with dismembering some. Is that confirmed? It's confirmed. It is confirmed. It's confirmed yes. Okay, I didn't see that on the news this morning, yeah, they, and they, I was they, waiting. They, they, yeah, he's a kid, you know, and yeah. they, you know, oh. So, but you know, I'll say it's confirmed from our end. Let's just say. No. That. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, right? Let, and that's been declared a terrorist act. Absolutely, because here we go. Um, this fifteen-year-old, right? Um, is using certain terminology um, and it's recorded on video, mm. you know. Um, and then we, because this 15 year old believes he's doing something for a religious cause, yes, right? Um, we are now looking at you know, a terrorism investigation mm. Mm. and let's look at the public sentiment on that. And for me, a guy who decides who's an adult. Mm-hmm. who has this hatred of women, mm-hmm. who decides to go and arm himself 
yep. walk into a sh- shopping center and then target women. Yep. Right? Go from place to place and try to do- take out as many as he can. Mm. Oh, there's a level of intention and strategic thinking, so to speak. Yeah, it certainly appears to be an element of planning, even if that planning's two minutes of planning or yep. days worth of planning. Yeah. He didn't accidentally fall in our kid going. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and, and, and there's a past. Yeah. He's got a history. Yeah. And then, but it's seen as so incredibly different from a 15 year old who also has interesting origins, right? Mm. Um, for a 15 year old to be even in that predicament, you've got yeah. to, something's not right. That's right. Something's not right. Um, and, you know, uh, it's taken advantage of and, and misguided in whatever ways. And then all of a sudden, um, it is seen so differently and it's going to be investigated differently. Mm. Um, and it's been, you know, the terrorism unit will investigate this and have already started. And the public sentiment, I guarantee, will be extremely different on, yes. on how to takes out. And a riot ensues as a result, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? They actually, you know, not just today... Which, which actually, in part, gives rise to the point why it becomes considered a terrorist act, yeah. right? Yeah, so th- they turn on the cops, Yeah. right? Yeah. The victim community turns yeah. on the police. Yep. Um, didn't allow the police to get in in the first place to, mm-hmm. to affect the arrest. And then the, the officer in, inside that do get into arrest, they're significantly outnumbered. And that mm-hmm. would have been the, not a great situation for them to no. be in. They become more a threat from the community than they are from the offender. I believe we'd call that shitstorm. Yeah. Is what they walked into. Yeah, r- r- ridiculous. Yeah. And then there's a lot of vigilante st- attacks that happen then after that, oh. right? It, it just snowballs into all these things. And like this, there's just so much that people you know need to take into context about when when things happen. We no longer live in a world where we're cut off from everybody else. Mm. The global context plays its role. It does, and you know this is there's a, there's a couple of points here to consider um, in in this particular instance. First of all, I go back to the fitness level. Yeah. Right, if you're a cop and you're at that situation, I've been in a riot, and I've been in those points where you're like. This is going to hurt. Yep. No matter what happens, yep. um, I'm not coming out of this um, without without an injury. But you're swinging your bat, and if you're punching on, if you've got to run, if you've got to do anything against, you know, what they they estimate thousands of people were there last night. I don't know yeah, if yeah. that's true or not, yeah. but look that way. Um, you know, numbers fluctuate and actual numbers change and things like that. But consider this: if you're in that role and you've got to protect yourself or someone else and the guy next to you, the girl next to you, whatever else, you you need to be fit, right? Yeah. Because there's nothing, in that point, there's nothing else helping you other than your skills, your verbal communication, your presence and your fitness. So that's that's number one for me. Knowing that you are at your peak every shift is important. Um, the other thing is that mob mentality yes. that comes into it. Yes. You see, what what happens there is some people turned up as onlookers they just you know what this is a part of their community and they're shocked and they're scared and they want to see if it's true and they turn up as onlookers some people turned up as vigilantes and some people turned up as this is a great way to take it out on the cops yeah this is a great opportunity and what happens is those onlookers created an environment that allows for a certain level of anonymity you see and the mob mentality grows and because you feel like hey i can't the police aren't stopping the first person, so then I'm not going to be caught, I'm not going to be identified. It grows and grows. And then the spectacle takes place, so then more onlookers come and more friends come because they want to see it. And it grows and the numbers that are you know, being basically viewed by the police, like the, the mass grows. And there is no such thing as crowd control or uh, riot control. It's management. Exactly right. right. You, you just there are never there is never going to be enough police resources to lock everybody up at that point. Yep, and you've got like again you you, you remember the Redfin uh, yeah. rides very well. Well, I was there. Yeah, yeah. I had Cronulla um, and the and yep. the, the, the day two with Lakemba, and it is extremely daunting mm-hmm. to see a sea of angry people yep. who you have no idea what they're carrying on them, and they just and you can sort of chairs, trolleys, everything gets launched at you that no one cares. And about. you don't even see where it comes no, from. And, that's and you're problem. looking this way, and it yeah. comes this way. And yeah, and that's a problem. Yeah. And, you, and you're also like, I'm not just worried about yourself. You're worried about your colleagues. And it's it's, it's it's harrowing. Yeah, and you know one of the things I think for the cops out there too, I've been in those situations when you're like, we have riot gear, we have helmets and shields, and yet management are often so keen not to allow that the usage of that. 
And from that perspective of they're worried it's going to inflame the crowd, but someone walked out of that with a broken jaw yeah. last night, yeah. you know, and, you know, concussion and whatever else. Um, and we, we're starting to see how much a brain injury affects your long-term, like just a concussion can affect your long-term yeah. health. And it's the thing about it, like I'm looking at, besides, let, let's say with the officers, sometimes you, you're in a tussle, mm-hmm. there's, you know, mm-hmm. it's going to happen, there's going to be some injury, there's going to be whatever. And some things you could forgive and say, well, it was the physicality of, of, the, of the situation, right? But when you're looking at police cars that have had their windows smashed yeah. in, right? What, what were you there for? Yeah. Like, what does that do? And thinking about it, what did the police respond to? Mm-hmm. They responded to your community representative, That's right. a very veneered man, a, a loved man. And you, getting you attacked. know that individual. Yeah, You've I met do. him, don't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Getting attacked, right? Um, so they're responding for you. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Um, because there's someone armed that's caused damage and they're mm-hmm. coming. But instead, and it sort of, it's like, to draw a parallel... How many times have we been to domestic violence situations where we're coming for the victim, then the victim turns on us too, right? And so cops from that also, that doesn't leave you. You kind of get cynical Mm. and you start to really have an aversion to people. Yes. You know? Um, And you sit there and you're like, I'm coming here to serve you, Mm. right? To protect you, to defend you. I'm putting my life on the line and I've got to worry about you more than I have to worry about like the, the offender. And exactly, the mob thing, it, that psychology is real, it's yeah. terrible, and it's, yep. it's something that you is really, really scary. Um, and I think we're, you know, the amount of, the, the problem with the, for the police now is, as you, as you know, which we can discuss later, is the numbers are dwindling. Yes. Right? So already their resources are so stretched to have incidents like Bondi and, um, and what happened last night at Fairfield, even like back-to-back mm. and that kind of stuff. Mate, like it's cops are coming from. Okay, I heard it all last night. I hear the yeah. chopper and I can hear the sirens, and, and they're coming from everywhere. And then it, it's just they're vulnerable because then then other the cops that don't come to the scene that are staying in their areas to patrol are now even more under resourced right. than they were before. They're they're really serious, and and that's the problem we have, where if the strategic leadership from the top doesn't make significant changes, mm-hmm. law enforcement. In this state and, and as a wider thing, and, in and, this country, yeah. and not only this country, across the world, yeah. we're seeing it. Yeah. You know, and I, I would say, and I would not be disparaging of any officer that was on that line last night, on the front line last night, that didn't have a thought of why am I doing this? Yeah, right. We came to help people, and the people of the community we were coming to help turned against yeah. us. Well, look at, look at us last night, just in our chat. Oh. So you and I and the rest of our team, all ex-police, ex, yeah. ex-detectives, so many years of service, we've all been to these kind of things before, all basically saying we're grateful, we're at mm. home with our families and not having to deal with this rubbish. Absolutely. Right? And I think that says a lot. Yep. That says a lot. And look, you know, the as, as you said before, we've the world is now on our doorstep. We live in a... People use the term global village. Yeah. More and more, I see the impacts of external worldviews coming into our country. I mean, only last week there was discussion from um, intelligence uh, in the intelligence circles, uh, and it was publicly available, that uh, you know, the some of the extremist far right movements are pushing for a race war. Yeah. Yeah. This last night. Yeah. That is exactly pushing that ideology inadvertently like right? and you got to wonder who is stirring the pot exactly. where exactly. you know who's was there someone behind and we we may know we may never know hopefully we will find out if there was if Saturday's action was just a mental health you know person with mental health issues that has you know not been seeking the gaining the treatment they need or or was there a bad actor somewhere just you know, whispering in the ear of someone um, through social media or text or, you know, through their publications changes a viewpoint for certain people in the community. And, it, and often for our listeners, if you've not been in law enforcement or military and things like that, you probably don't, you may not believe it, but you'd be surprised how easy some people are um, gently coerced into a pattern of belief without critical thinking. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this space and I'm thinking... You know that one of the first things, and 
I said on our because we chatted about this we on Saturday now our company has a group chat and we look after a number of different clients that we provide intelligence to and um, when it came up we were just discussing different tactics and strategies and one of the things I said is the, the danger of copycats yep. um, and that was Saturday and then we see last night's incident and that's that's not me being an amazing individual that is just straight out of the literature yep. on people on the path of intended violence yep. that is why in the states they've stopped and they they've started here they stopped naming um and kind of glorifying the acts through the news coverage of people that committed um you know these dreadful mass murders yeah. because it incited more whenever you see one you often see more because someone else who's deranged in the community or i can do better or i want to be i want to be like that person for whatever reason um now step away from that after the lint siege cafe siege i thought surely the landscape has to change mm -hmm. right in law enforcement and policing and it didn't. There was kind of like a heightened level and it's kind of like a bump and everybody kind of forgot about it. And then I go back to that Hornsby police shooting, another, a man with a knife in a public place in a West, like just outside of a Westfields. Um, and you start thinking about the, all the gun reforms came in when I was a kid yep. from the Strathfield massacre that happened in a shopping centre. Yes. Now, when I go to the airport, I look around and there's armed AFP officers and AFP officers carrying long arms. And yet Chris Minns, I don't have a persuasion one way or the other and I don't have a problem with Chris Minns for anyone who's a strict Labor supporter or anything else. <laughs> um, it's not against him but it's this point of we will review security but um, firearms won't be a part of that. Well, okay, if you don't want to give firearms to security officers in these places. First of all, ask yourself a question. What's the difference between uh, West, or any Westfields in the Christmas rush versus an airport? Yes, I understand there's a, you know, the threat of people coming in, taking planes and doing whatever else, but much of the threat is deemed from the fact that there is a large number of people transiting through this hub, Yep. right? Yep. That is exactly the same thing that you have at a Westfields. And if you're intent on just doing harm to people, yeah. that exists in a shopping centre. Absolutely, absolutely. And the, there's so many more barriers and screening in an airport, mm. and there's virtually nothing in a, no. in a shopping centre. And, and the airport has on-site police. Like, it is, they have their own station there. Yes. Um, and more numbers of security and things like that. And I guess this brings me to a point where I think about it and I say, well, I don't want... And look, Danny and I are directors of a security company, a manpower security company, and all our guys are ex-military and ex-police. I've got guys that have come to us straight out of protecting the Prime Minister and the Royal Family, yeah. and they say, look, we'd love to be a bodyguard, you know, work for you guys. I'm like, I'd love for you too as well, but you need to go and do the course. You can't get... Even though you've been doing things at a much higher level than everybody else, you still have to go and do a Cert two course for a number of weeks... And then do an additional elective to be a bodyguard of like four or five it's days. It's the dumbest crap. And you can't even have a... Here's the thing that kills me. You're allowed to have a firearm in security to protect money yep. or jewellery or valuables, yep. but a life or numerous lives, no. not included in that. No. If We're a Rolex, risk, I can protect you. Yes. Yep. But uh, if you're a, an individual under threat, and this is the thing that no one's talking about, when... Police numbers are dwindling because, and rightfully so, I understand why many people are leaving. The threat environment is changing. If you look at just here in New South Wales, the BOXAR, um, which is Bureau of Crime Statistics, um, etc., they're showing an upward trend in crime and violent crime. Yep. Um, we see that all over Australia, Queensland, uh, Victoria, Alice Springs, etc. Um, and yet no one's looking at security and saying, well, let's take the people that have the experience and bring them in and let them protect those places. I mean, who do you want handling a firearm if it's not ex-cops that carry it every day, well, ex-military? What happened, what happened you know? straight after? Remember the ad I showed you? The, straight after the Bondi incident, That's right, yeah. security company does a, calls, it does a call out, I want, I want only ex-cops and ex-military. Mm -hmm. To do what? Hold your baton. Yeah. Like, you want them to come out, you recognise their skill set, you're by... Definition saying they are superior to the existing cohort mm -hmm. of security, 
but they need to do that stupid course. Yes. Right? Trained by people that don't have the experience, qualification, yep. or professionalism. Yeah, so that they can mm-hmm. be deemed worthy to hold the baton or to not even have anything, just stand there. And, and, and like there's no, and there's no distinction between in, a, in qualification mm-hmm. and licensing, right, or recognition of who they are. That's right. And the laughable fact of this is if those same professionals that are here, and no disrespect to some of the other states, but, um, you know, New South Wales police, actually all the states, let me take that back, all the states train their police pretty well and they have a lot of experience. But if, you're, if you come out and you're in Queensland cops or if these guys move from New South Wales wanted to get a security licence in Queensland, they could RPL, so recognition of prior learning, yep. their security um, qualifications and get the licence. Yep. Here in New South Wales, no, not allowed. You have to sit there and do the course with some guy that just... Do you know this doesn't exist in most places in the world, right? No, I had no idea. In, in the places I've travelled, right, first of all, if, if you've done so many years as a police officer... Um, many of them retain their firearm, mm. right? And will always um, have the ability to work in these kind of spaces uh, because they recognize mm. their skill and strategy and they want to keep that within the group so that they're training. That's right. And look, think about the opportunity for mentorship and consulting and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. There's a reason why s- smart um, employers will go and look for those certain strategies. I mean, look who leads all the investigations for banks and major areas. Yeah. They're all ex detectives. That's right. right? That, that's what they've done. And that's people that have, you know, bean counters, if you want to, if mm. you want to say. Mm. They've recognised, hey, we need to get these guys in for their talent. But security industry hasn't. No. Really? Yeah. Like, really. And at the top of the chain, in all, in, in all across, and again, particularly New South Wales, I cannot fathom how they don't have this understanding as why would you not create a separate stream yes. for ex-law enforcement and perhaps military as well, or probably mm. uh, do it together, right? To go, hey, if you've done X amount of years and this is your level of training, let's recognise what you've done. Yep. Surely at least your communication skills and your tactical prowess gets you at least the minimum licence, if mm-hmm. not all mm-hmm. these other sort of benefits. Again, around the world, they have police that are contractors. Yeah. Right? They, they moonlight as security guards while they're cops. That's right. Right? And then the, So not even the conflict of, of uh, interest I- issue comes up here. Then We're talking to people that are no longer in the police have done 5, 10, 20 years service, know how to deal with their weapons and know Because what... they did it every day. That's like right. a, a security guard, some security guards won't see a terrible incident or a bad incident or deal with an angry person yeah. ever. Yeah. And, you know, that's, all you, that's your daily job in the cops. You're always dealing with dangerous people, bad individuals. And, look, I'm a proponent of gun control. I think gun control is an important part and I'm, I appreciate it. But... I, Give professionals the tools they need. And if you want an example of this, go back to Saturday, look at who some of the first victims were, which is the security officers. And if those security officers had had a firearm, first of all, would that individual have been deterred? Highly likely. Mm -hmm. Second of all, would we have six people dead? Would we have, was it 12 people, I think, that were injured? More, I think. More, 16. So you have to look at that and go, okay, all these people are already, we've got people that are a lot, you know, we're talking about ex-cops, ex-military, so they've been vetted, they've done psych tests, they've done whatever else, they've got skill sets, they've been trained, and then they're still going to get a security licence and a firearms licence, which means additional vetting, and the security industry requires firearms, people with a firearm certification to train as often as police, yeah. which is an annual shoot, and a lot of these guys I know shoot Externally as well, as in they're in gun clubs or they're doing more training even though they don't have to. So they're actually more pre- precise, more proficient with their firearm than the average cop. And not recognised for it, nor do no. they get any kind of financial incentive or no. anything for it. And it, uh, it's a loss of skill set. It makes no yeah. sense to me. I mean, I remember even going through when they would say, for example, if you join certain tactical units like the TOU back in the mm-hmm. day, for example... That's $150,000 a year of extra training. That's back then, right? We're going yeah. back 20 years. The, for someone in the TOU now, um, or actually just a few years ago, their training, their base training was worth about a million dollars. So you're telling me the state spends, let's say, $5 million on them for mm-hmm. five years, right? Yep. Then they leave. Yep. Go do a cert too. Yep. Really? Like That's it's right. the most embarrassing stupidity I've and, ever seen. And cops just don't, 
then why would you go and do that and sit in a class of people that you know don't have your experience and then there's this thing right oh, you would have seen it. I know I've seen it where you have you have the wannabe guys you know the you some of you people out there listening some of our listeners will have experienced no doubt the I would have you know if I had have been there you know yeah. the, all the rest of that crap no one knows what they're going to do till they're in that situation yep but you sit in a room full of those guys. I remember we had a guy um, for the security company came, you know, he's, we were talking about some of our close personal protection work we do with some of our clients, which is mainly what we do now. And I guess it's a bugbear of mine because most of our guys are ex-cops and ex-military that have done all the courses. But the thing about it is this guy comes to us and he's been a doorman. He's like, oh, I'm all about that, you know, close personal protection life. This guy got sweaty walking up five steps. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like he was, he thought he was some kind of Jason Bourne. And at the first sign of trouble, he was water. Yeah. But you have that, cops don't want to sit in the class with that guy. They don't, they don't want to be, you know, feel like they're on the same level. And there's a, with police leaving, I think there's an element, a space now for a better professional security officer to step in but the legislation's got to catch up and allow it. Absolutely. It's got to be a completely different class and it can have its own really high standards because mm. they'll meet them. Like, yeah. that's not an issue. And I think the consumer would pay more yeah. to have that kind of person defending their assets and family and yeah. property and employees and whatever than have what they have at the moment, you know, at your normal sort of construction site that no one goes to and there's someone sleeping in his car yeah. on 35 bucks an hour. Right? And you know what? The, the fact is... You are 100% right because the people that use our services, the people that use our competitor services, they insist on people that have that law enforcement military training. Yeah. They, they see it. As you said, people that head up banks, people that are you know, ultra high net worth individuals. Yeah. And the worst thing I, I, I have to hear or I have to say um, is when they come and apply for work with us, have you got your security license? Mm. Like, I shouldn't ever have to say that. Yep. Yeah, because of what you I've got close personal protection, people that were in dignitary protection. 10 years specialist, specialist mm. defending and protecting heads of state and doing strategy for royal family members yeah. for on visits and that kind of stuff from the, the most famous celebrities to presidents to, to kings. But I need you to go and do this six-week course on then It's ridiculous. Like, that's just dumb. It's just yeah. dumb and it makes no sense to me. But, hey, it's been an interesting conversation. We've been looking forward to coming back. Um, so we we did have you. something else planned, I have to say, for the first episode <laughs> that this, this took place. This, yeah, this took pretty um, I'd say. Can I, before we wrap up, I just want to say, people, uh, when I was talking about fitness before, one thing I meant to say is we're all responsible for our own safety. I, I'm a big fan of the dads um, and the parents that you saw kind of get their kids out. I, I mentioned the dad because, you know, there's that video of the guy, the assailant, approaching the father and he's... First of all, I see the two little girls and the mum in, in front of him and I'm like, I'd be running. I'd be telling those guys to run. But he turns around and he kind of puts his arms out like, you're going through me. Yeah. And that guy diverts. Yeah. And you know, as fathers, as parents, as members of the community, I'm not saying you should do that, but we've got to expect that something bad could have happened at any point in time. Yeah. Um, as I said, the landscape is changing. The global politics, global issues are in our, in our land now. Be... Have an understanding. Have some situational, situational awareness. awareness. Know what you would do in those instances. Know your exits. Um, I know I called my wife on Saturday who was out doing the shopping. I'm like, I know where you are. Make sure you look for the exits that aren't there, right? Yeah. That you don't normally walk into. So, yeah. you know, if that's a loading dock. Fire exits are, are a really good one. Um, you know, back doors in and out of in our places because invariably whenever something bad happens, and you would have seen this, is that everybody runs from the entrance they came in, which is often the same entrance that your threat is coming through. Um, so that's that's number one. Number two for me is this. I've heard any number of so-called professionals, um, and if you're listening to this rather than watching it, I did the little inverted commas <laughs> thing with my fingers. So-called professionals talking out of their hat about you know this, that, and the other. And I, I particularly speak of one who I know is, well, I would say, barely better than a fraud um, in, in, the, in what they put forward. And I've heard some guys that are fantastic and give exact, the exact information you'd want the public to have, but this, this guy is one of those people. He's been on TV and radio and things like that for any number of things. My point is this, just because you hear something, even if it's us, 
um, feel free to fact check it. Yep. Look at look into someone's background. Make sure they are who they say they are, um, and don't take everything you see in here as gospel. A, employ across all your life a critical thinking hat so that you have the tools available to you to make a reasonable rational decision um, and you can be responsible for your own safety because as we said police numbers are dwindling more things are happening um, and crime is on the way up and one of the reasons we do this podcast is to shine a light on issues in policing etc um, but and also to give some encouragement to the cops out there but really for you in the community to understand what it's like to carry a badge and have that duty, but also so you can be safe. Um, in our work day to day, one of the best things we do and one of the reasons why we have such great ex-detectives on our team is because we still get to help people. Yep. And in this part, I want you to understand that we are trying to help you. Uh, we want you to understand that threats exist out there and it's not nice to think about, but please, um, Take a little bit of responsibility. Just set five minutes aside to have a bit of a plan when you go to these places. Absolutely. It's a, diff it's a different world. It's mm -hmm. a different world now. We've got to look after each other. Um, we'd like to thank our wonderful sponsors, Precision Integrity Services. You can find them on... www.privateinvestigatorsydney.com.au and ictechnology, ictechnology.com.au. It's been great to come back, um, Season 2, and we hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, Stay tuned for the next episodes and we'll see you next time. See you guys.